Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have back with us Rexford Catnall, who's the president of Keats Group, and we'll be talking about tax planning with high net worth clients. Rexford, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be back. Hey, so I know this is a really powerful topic because I think that too many times people get into the uh, mode of just here's my, you know, proverbial shoebox full of receipts. Let me take it to the CPA and fill in the blanks to fill out my taxes. But tax planning takes a whole new approach that's proactive. So talk a little bit about what tax planning is as compared to typical individuals or business owners as it and then also how it contrasts with a high net worth client. Well, the, we we can start with the high net worth. The, the late great Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's partner at Berkshire Hathaway until he he passed away late last year, uh, they worked together for forty five years, and and he was Charlie was still working in the business at age ninety nine, if you can imagine. That. Wow. He he wrote in a, a biography in terms of business mistakes that I've seen over a long lifetime. I would say that trying to minimize taxes too much is one of the great standard causes of really dumb mistakes. He said that Uh in his book. And and then you look under the covers a little bit. Let's recognize that that Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are among the richest people in the world and had a tax rate below 1%. Wow. So the conclusion from that is they have world-class tax advisors and they are immensely, you know, charitable. So those are the lessons learned from from that quote. The 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 lay of the land. There were a couple of pieces of of retirement legislation, well known, well published, publicized. It's the Secure Act and the Secure Act 2.0 that are impactful areas for people with with meaningful wealth and and meaningful IRAs. To cite one specific example, and they contain a lot of tax landmines. So c- Congress has turned IRAs into a poor asset for wealth transfer. And many professionals or business families have large retirement accounts where they have an untaxed asset with zero basis or low basis in the business. And and to to cite the example of of regular people who are not necessarily high net worth. My father passed away about a year and a half ago, and he had crossed into his 90s and uh, was not a wealthy man, but my father had some assets, including two small remaining IRAs. And and now when you're above 90 years old, you don't have large IRAs anymore. You've been forced to distribute yep. uh, those funds for a lot of years. But he 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 had small IRAs remaining. <clears throat> Three of us children, all close, inherited those IRAs, and so you had two IRAs that were broken into. Excuse me, broken my throat. That were broken into three beneficiary IRAs, all with required minimum distributions, and those accounts uh, came by privilege of the broker dealer uh, with three new account setup fees and, mm-hmm. and three account closing fees when all three of us decided that we weren't going to continue uh, to hold a $1,500 asset with required yeah. minimum distributions for the next 20 years. So that's a quick snapshot of, of of tax planning. There were many things that we should have done with him. Uh, he was well planned. He was well organized. He knew how to work a spreadsheet. Uh, but he had done a, a number of things on the tax front that were really missed opportunities. Mm-hmm. So if, if I use the IRA example if for higher net worth uh, families that might have a one million dollar IRA. You really have an IRA statement in your name for one million dollars, 
but the government owns 40%, 50%, maybe more yeah. of that million yeah. dollar IRA. And, and to get because money it's out never of been that, taxed. It's never been taxed. Yeah. And to get money out of that traditional retirement plan, let's take a common tax planning strategy, you know, a Roth conversion. Every financial advisor with a billing sheet in their pocket is ready with a Roth conversion. But there's more than just the concept of Roth conversion. There's the mechanics of how you do it well. And there are some misconceptions, I think, uh, uh, that, um, that they should not generate higher taxes for you when you do Roth conversions. High, higher income clients are not eligible to contribute to a Roth. You know, the accounts have contribution limits of seven or $8,000 a year, depending on your age, and, and an income limit uh, to make a full contribution. Um, and for a married couple, that's about $230,000. But Congress allowed Roth conversions to continue under the SECURE Act. The final rules are out, and that's still the case. Uh, Roth conversions are allowed. Now, a Roth conversion is a, is a transfer of funds from a traditional IRA directly to a Roth IRA, and that's taxable at your current marginal tax rate. If you're 59 and a half or older, and you really Roth conversions below 59 and a half are generally not a good idea, that rarely a good idea. You're not going to incur a penalty, but you are going to pay income tax. And so if you take a, a $1 million IRA example and you convert $100,000 of it in one year, the conventional wisdom is to convert you know, enough dollars to optimize a current tax bracket, an effective tax bracket, but not bump you into a higher tax bracket. Mm -hmm. I think this thinking is flawed. I, I'm not a fan of tax bracket management. I think it's a rather small and, and uncontrollable strategy. When you convert $100,000, you could bump into a higher marginal tax bracket. And let's just say that if you took that 100000 and it bumped you into a 32% bracket, you were in a 24, you still have the lower brackets to use up. You're not going to be taxed at 32% on all $100,000. you are going to fill the other brackets up. And so let's just say the math is $50,000 at a 32% higher tax bracket. You're going to pay four. $5,000 in taxes that year. But you've now taken $100,000 out of a taxable account. And uh, if that $100,000 grew for uh, 20 years at 7%, uh, you know, you're going to wind up with an account with $400,000 all taxable to you or your spouse or your beneficiaries. And it's going to cost you a, a lot more than the extra tax you paid. Now, the one one added comment: it really is most wise to do a Roth conversion with you know, when you are able with cash or other sources of cash that are not in the retirement plan. You do not want to withhold some of that converted funds to pay the extra tax. You you want to have the ability to pay the tax outside with outside funds. And you need a little bit of runway for then the money in the Roth to grow tax-free to make it worth your while. So there's a couple of things there working together, right? You do. You do. That's correct. Yep. There tax management strategies, not not only with with uh Retirement accounts, but including retirement accounts, they, they abound in family businesses as well, mm -hmm. using compensation or retirement benefit plans, which today, with the SECURE Act, a retirement benefit plan for a company that does not have one, which is the most small businesses, they can be started with up to 100% federal tax credits. You can start a plan and even have some of the contributions to that plan for employees paid by the federal government for a period of time. There are tax penalties yeah. to widows, you know, who will file, uh, or widowers who will file as single tax payers on the death of a spouse. Uh, you know, the tax penalties are dramatic. You, you, when you become a single tax filer, in all kinds of areas that we just don't think about, a homeowner couple, who, you know, who gets a five hundred thousand dollar lifetime home sale exclusion, receives instead a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar home tax exclusion 
or capital gains exclusion, beginning with the first tax reporting year as a single taxpayer. So in the year of death, you have that tax year to be able to take advantage of a $500,000 uh, capital gain on, on a primary home. Those are the kind of things that we don't think very often about. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned tax risk, legislative risk, and we've talked about several of those options. What are some of the final thoughts on how those fit into properly structuring a financial plan? Yeah, well, the, the, an example of the tax risk is if I go back to the, the SECURE Act, o- overnight the SECURE Act eliminated something called the stretch IRA, which if a, if a large IRA was inherited by children, let's say children beneficiaries, those children who inherited the IRA could spread or stretch the withdrawals or income from that IRA over their lifetime. So think think about that. If you have you know, a, a 30-year-old or even a 40-year-old might have a 30-year life expectancy to take income out of the IRA, the stretch IRA now requires the distributions or that entire fund be depleted within 10 years. So you might have, uh, you know, marry a, an attorney in a successful law firm in peak earning years, inheriting a, a large amount from a million dollar IRA or a half a million dollar IRA, who's in a in a in their highest income earning years, and now have to begin depleting that account either every year or at the end of year nine before ten years. Th- those are those are tax risks. Um, before the Secure Act actually took took effect, that's a legislative risk. So a legislative risk is any risk that Congress could change the rules. Um, so, um, you know, a tax risk today is the standard deductions um, that we enjoy. And the estate tax exemptions that we enjoy that are nearly 30, over $30 million for a 65-year-old couple, they drop by nearly half 16 months from now mm. because the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came with its sunset legislation and those tax planning windows close at the end of December 31st, 2025. But an example of legislative risk is Prior to 1994, I think it was, Social Security income was not taxed until it was. Legislation passed in 83, took effect in 1984, and and imposed taxes that started at 50% and then went to 85% of Social Security uh, income as taxable income. So we can think of legislative risk as something that takes place every two-year election cycle. Regardless of what party wins, yep. the rules can change and we can't control it. That the way to control it is is tax planning and exploring one of the a myriad of ways of of, uh, of zero tax um, assets. We spend a lot of time thinking about. Yep. (laughs) That's not a fun topic, is it? (laughs) So uh, from working with clients for so many years, I'm sure you've seen people make good decisions, bad decisions, and been misinformed. What are some of the misconceptions that you find clients have uh, regarding their uh, uh, tax planning that are people that are high net worth clients? Because I feel that there's some some things that they let slip through the cracks because they just don't know. What is it? Some of the things you're seeing? Well, I, I think uh, some of the conventional wisdom about um, taxable and and um, tax deferred accounts is an area that is where people draw conclusions that are not always best for them. Uh, we we think that having a dividend paying uh, set of stock funds in a retirement account defers that interest or excuse me, defers that income, and therefore it's not taxable. And so uh, interest earning accounts or fixed income earning accounts ought to be in in pre-tax retirement accounts. But keep in mind when when those um, dividends or earnings from in retirement accounts um, compound, they're compounding before tax. 
And so you are triggering not only a future income tax bill, but a capital gains bill from those that stacks on top of your ordinary income. So I think hmm. that's a, a dangerous slope to to, to conclude uh, quickly without some analysis and careful thought, careful planning, where your assets ought to be invested. Uh, what, one way of, uh, of of thinking about this, making the point that I just made is is having zero dividend stocks um, in a taxable account. If you think about that, a zero dividend stock in a taxable account does not throw off income. There's no short or immediate term tax. They can appreciate. There is no tax as long as they appreciate until you sell them. If you sell them because you needed them money from those funds for an emergency fund, your worst case is capital gains tax. And if you don't use that money and it uh, transfers through your estate to beneficiaries, it gets a step up in basis, zero tax. There's an example. Yeah. Huge. Other, other areas, you know, gifting is a, a major area of planning with qualified charitable distributions, which, you know, allow us to use our RMDs to, to gift to charity and, and reduces our taxes at the same time. Mm. I think that the old saying, you know, people just don't know what they don't know. That's a scary proposition because if you know about something, it gives you the opportunity to implement. But if you don't know, and you you mentioned stacking, you know, if you don't know that one could stack on the other and cause a whole lot more tax uh, liability than you needed, it might be smart to kind of know about that. So I think that is a, really a powerful mindset that people need to keep in mind. What do you do with uh, when you're working with clients that are, you know, multi generational and talking with them about the the end, like wealth transfer? So like, you know, we, we talk about exit planning for a business. Well, in, in one sense, it's exit planning for your family, because when you exit, you need to make sure you're transferring your wealth in the best possible way. What are some tips that you work with your clients on there? Well, I think the professionals that are doing this are focused on goals and not risks outwardly. And by that, I mean, um, I think that there are a lot of financial plans that are put together based on fears of market risk and thoughtful plans, you know, ought to be a deep dive on goals, especially for multi-generational families, for blended families, very big, uh, very big issue that ought to be uh, done with as much care. There are advanced uses of hybrid insurance uh, trust strategies that are still effective. Some of the old trust strategies are are not appropriate for post Secure Act world, but there are still um, some sophisticated trust strategies that work very well for asset protection and provide some not only tax advantages but flexibility for supporting the income of a surviving spouse you know, with uh, you know, perhaps an irrevocable um, trust where you, you can't revoke the trust, but you can guide the income and the distribution of those assets even after death. Um, for these families, we, we also pay a lot of close attention to not only tax risks, which we've been talking about, but lawsuits and predator risks and risks from blended families in divorce. You know, the risk of, of wanting to support your children as beneficiaries or second marriages and all of the, of the legal pitfalls or, or landmines that are involved in, in being disinherited. And we see those in real life. You know, it really is a, a like a gift when you when you're planning this for your family wealth transfer. It just really is a gift to have a nice clean plan for them, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. You, you finished your thought there. You were making. Well, I I I, I 
popping out of my mind was the issue of health care, you know, yeah. probably the most common major risk that families that families face. All this, this debate about should we have long-term care insurance? And I, I think uh, I could tell my my father's story about that, too. He had a long-term care uh, insurance policy, and I've had many clients that have them. And there are often better strategies using, you know, asset-based insurance options that are excellent replacements for long-term care uh, insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to know those options. And, you know, we're talking uh, here about tax planning. Well, the key word there is plan. And if you have a plan in place and if it's well ahead of, of, uh, you know, when you need it, then you've got time to carefully and cautiously make adjustments or choose the best option. Um, and like you were mentioning uh, previously about the Roth conversion, you know, if you do it, too, you know, too late toward retirement, then you don't have time to recoup the tax hit and the growth in the tax-free environment. So similar things with many of the points that you're making there is make a decision to understand all the options in front of you well ahead of when you need it. And especially if you have a higher net worth, every single little percentage point is amplified. Because if you have a higher net worth, boy, it could one little deviation or one little change in a positive direction can really make a big uh, difference. So Rexford, these have been so some really powerful points. Wrap us up with your final thoughts and how can people learn more and connect with you? Well, I would say uh, give us a call or send me an email. Our website, keatsgroup.com, has our contact information, or I'll gladly um, provide my email address, which is R-C-A-T-T-A-N-A-C-H at keatsgroup.com. Keats Group is K-E-A-T-S group.com, and, and uh, we'd love to give you a call. Expert. Excellent, Rexford. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a real uh, pleasure talking with you again. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.